delighted um, to be able to introduce Kelsa Arango um, uh, as today's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Distinguished Visiting Lecturer. Uh, Dr. Arango is an internationally renowned child and adolescent psychiatrist who's made major contributions to translational science in our field, and particularly with regard to um, early onset psychosis. He's had a truly extraordinary and productive scientific career and somehow at the same time has managed to take on major leadership roles in both academic and organized psychiatry. Currently, he's the director of the Gregorio Marignon Psychiatric and Mental Health Institute and head of the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Hospital Universitario Gregorio Marignon. I apologize for, um, uh, for my uh, pronunciation. Uh, he holds adjunct professorships here at UCSF and the University of Maryland, and he's a visiting professor um, at of psychiatry at King's College. Um, as I said, he's held major uh, international leadership roles, uh, including presidency of the European College of Neuropharm Neuropsychopharmacology, past chairman of the National Commission for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, appointed by the Spanish Ministry of Health. Uh, he served as the first scientific director of the Spanish Psychiatric Research Network uh, with uh, more than 20 centers and 400 researchers um, from its creation in 2008 until 2017. And he currently serves on the board of the European Brain Council, which is the uh, European Commission's advisory board. Um, his academic career, no less prolific, um, after he completed his training uh, he and uh, fellowship at the University of Maryland, uh, School of Medicine in Baltimore. He's uh, now co-authored 11 books and more than 675 publications, including the first longitudinal studies comparing children and adolescents uh, with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders, showing uh, that these are uh, progressive brain disorders, particularly with loss of frontal gray matter uh, in those children who develop schizophrenia. Uh, he's published extensively as well on antipsychotics, mainly on their effect, the lack of effectiveness for negative symptoms and on their safety and tolerability in children and adolescents. Uh, he's participated in 77 competitively funded research projects and served as a principal investigator on 58 of those. Reading his CV made me tired. Uh, he is uh, really, truly one of the leading researchers internationally who's helped define the roadmap for mental health research for the European Commission. Not surprisingly, he's been the recipient of numerous national and international awards, far too many to name here, but I'll note a few particularly uh, remarkable accolades. He was awarded the Dean Award by the American College of Psychiatrists, uh, the CIMP Sumitomo Sanobian Brain Health Clinical Research Award by the International College of Neuropsychopharmacology, and he's an appointed member of the Royal Academy of Medicine in Spain. And Last, certainly not least, he is the quintessential model clinician scientist. On top of everything else that I've just told you, he still sees patients two days a week in a first episode psychosis clinic and leads a clinic for patients with 21Q11 syndrome. It is a true honor and pleasure to have him back in San Francisco. Um, and uh, he's going to talk with us today about a critically important and timely topic, and that's primary prevention in mental health. Kelso, it's wonderful to see you back. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Na uh, Matt, for that really kind and um, um, probably excessive and very generous uh, uh, introduction. And I have to tell that I'm really glad to be back here. You know, we spent a, a sabbatical with, uh, with Mara, my wife, and my three kids here in 2014. And I really had a, a wonderful time with many, you know, many of you here in, in, uh, in, in the audience. So it's really nice to be back home. Um, so today I will be talking about uh, primary uh, prevention. This is not one of my regular topics. Uh, this is just to show you how my work has evolved since I was here in, in, in 2014 and the type of, uh, of research and clinical uh, work that we are doing in my um, um, institution. And, and again, I will remark that it will be about primary, not secondary or tertiary uh, prevention that I will be talking um, about. So this is my conflict of interest, uh, public and private um, funding in the last 10 years. And this is the outline of my 40, uh, 42 minutes uh, talk. Uh, introduction, uh, prevention in, in, in psychiatry, something we hear a lot about, but probably we don't do much about. Uh, then uh, something that I've been working uh, with, actually with some of the uh, 
people that have been uh, um, at UCSF, like um, Oscar Marin and, and, you know, and Mara, my, uh, my wife, uh, trying to shift the, the, um, the focus on um, therapeutic windows that are open uh, during development. And then I will give you some practical uh, examples of how does all these you know, uh, studies, research, uh, theory, translate into better practice and better quality of life for the patients that we take care of. So if you will have to uh, leave now, um, this will be the uh, take home message and the highlight of, of my talk. And this was said by Frank Douglas, it's easier to build strong children than to repair um, a broken man. But the reality is that we in the field of psychiatry for decades or a century now, we have been uh, sitting in a space of um, area of comfort where we feel like, you know, we wait until things go really wrong and then we admit patients in, um, in hospital and we treat people with uh, very chronic um, um, conditions. And we are used to that and we know how to do it. We have done it for, uh, for a long time. And this is uh, like in, you know, a nice area of, of comfort. So we have been uh, mostly doing tertiary prevention in, in, in psychiatry. Uh, just a little bit of um, secondary prevention. You have you know wonderful uh, first episode clinic here in um, UCSF, which will be a nice example of secondary prevention. One uh, uh, patients have had a first psychotic episode. We try to improve that outcome. But what about primary prevention and or even primordial or, or, or promotion of, uh, ment of mental health? Well, even though that we have all learned at school many years ago that prevention is better than cure. The reality is that it's really, really scarce. And if we look around, you know, you take last issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Lancet, uh, British Medical Journal, all the big, big journals in medicine, I bet you that there will be at least one or two papers on primary prevention in other areas of medicine. And, you know, if I ask you, or if, you know, if I stop someone now walking on the street and I ask, can we prevent diabetes? The answer will probably be yes. Can we prevent heart attack? Yes. Can we prevent, can we prevent uh, breast cancer? Yes. Can we prevent schizophrenia? Can we prevent autism? Can we prevent bipolar disorder? People will have more doubts about if we can prevent those, these mental conditions as compared to other medical conditions. So I don't need to um, convince you I mean, tons of papers out there that, you know, with a really nice longitudinal um, cohort and clinical trials that, yes, you can prevent uh, diabetes. Uh, yes, you can prevent cancer. And in fact, this is the, uh, here in the United States, males and, males and females. Uh, in blue, you have the people who die from cancer on a given year. And in red, the people who, that would have died if there were no preventative measures. So the difference between the red line and the blue line is how many people leave, you know, or males and females live in this in this country thanks to preventative measures in in uh, in cancer. Well, you go to PubMed and do a, a, a search, type prevention and cardiovascular disease, and you come up with two hundred and eleven thousand uh, papers. Uh, but if you do the same with prevention psychiatry or prevention depression psychosis, that's the tiny amount of papers that you will uh, that you will retrieve. And again, many of them are more theory papers rather than, uh, than clinical um, research. Um, and that, again, is because you know, we have not put enough attention into uh, prevention. Um, so this is a nice um, editorial from JAMA some years ago. And says that in a really developing country, one of the leader countries in the world called United States of America, only, um, like, do I have a pointer? Um, no, well, well it's, it's, written, it's written there. 21% uh, of all infants, and this is the US, 21% of all infants and toddlers were assessed in a standardized way for developmental delays. Only 20% in the United States. So if you don't look for developmental delays, you know, it's probably gonna be too late when you make a like, diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental disorder like autism, right? In terms of um, funding, this is probably with Wellcome Trust, the largest uh, funding body in, uh, in the UK, uh, M M MQ. And this is where the money goes in terms of funding. So around 50% underpinning research and etiology, and then 4.5% at the very bottom, 
prevention of disease and conditions and promotion of well-being. So that's you know huge discrepancy into uh, how much funding and interest and publications go into uh, prevention in mental health as compared to other areas of, um, of, of, of medicine. Well, I strongly believe that things in our lives, things in the world happen always for good reasons. It's not a matter of chance or um, some mysterious or spiritual things. And the two main reasons why we're not that interested in prevention in mental health as compared to other uh, medical specialties, uh, maybe two. One, it's not possible. Yes, we can prevent you know, all those uh, physical conditions, but we cannot prevent mental disorders. And the second one will be, yes, they can be preventable, but it's too expensive. And you know, there's a limited budget and the budget should go where, wherever it's more cost efficient. So as uh, researchers, we should uh, rule out the null hypothesis here. And for the first one, it's not possible. I'm going to bring you some data and recent data you know, published in the last two or five years showing that it is possible. But I just want to bring this paper from 1997 showing that the effect size of some of these primary prevention interventions is larger than the effect size of SSRIs to treat depression. So we have known for a while. So it cannot be an excuse that we are not doing it because we don't have data showing that it is um, um, effective. And this is for primary prevention. Secondary prevention, and again, I will not be talking about, but that's clear. You know, you treat ADHD, and chances that these kids will not grow up, grow up as having a conduct disorder or substance, uh, substance use um, uh, misuse are like, you know, a half uh, that if they're not treated. So it is possible. Well, it's too expensive. That would be the second probably reason for not doing it, or the most obvious reason. Well, for that, I only need to bring you this. And this is data from uh, Martin Knapp and Dave McDay that we have been collaborating with them in the last uh, five years in a number of projects uh, from the London School of Economics. And this is how many pounds you get back for each pound you invest in any of these uh, interventions. If you have less than one pound, that means it costs you more than you uh, get back. So for instance, um, health visitor interventions to reduce postnatal depression. No, yeah, that's uh, uh, 0 0.33. But some of, for some others, like early intervention in psychosis, 17.97. A screening for alcohol misuse, 11.75. Prevention of conduct disorders through social and emotional learning programs, 83 pounds back from each pound you invest in that. It's a huge return. And this is not only for the health system, you know, in, in countries like uh, uh, most countries in Europe with, with public and um, health systems, all these, uh, you know, the money re is returned for, um, you know, better employment, social services, less uh, possibilities to go to jail and, and, and things like that. But uh, you, see, you can see huge returns for many of these uh, interventions. Suicide prevention through uh, breach safety barriers, 54 pounds back for each pound you invest. So this year, uh, in uh, February uh, 2022, uh, that, that, uh, David McDade and, and Ailey Park uh, published this very, very interesting uh, report, the economic case of, uh, for investing in the prevention of mental health condition in the UK. And it has been very recently, as recent as September, that the European, uh, European Union has approved uh, to have a multi-billionaire uh, investment in uh, prevention uh, for mental health uh, disorders in, um, in Europe. This is probably due to the um, awareness that the pandemic has made that you know, we have more 25% more cases of depression uh, in the world, 27% more cases of anxiety uh, in, in the world, and that you know, we can prevent them and, they are, um, and this prevention is cost, um, is cost effective. So why? if it can be done, and in many cases, it's um, cost effective. Why still we don't do it? Well, this is the third reason, which I strongly believe is the correct one. So this was a nice study in long time ago, which uh, nurses went to um, houses of 
people with low socioeconomic status, uh, women that were pregnant at that time, and they had uh, all these uh, um, help from, from nurses and, and a few months or, or a year after uh, the kids were, uh, were born. So the whole program took, um, um, uh, was a two year was a two year program, and during those two years, there was uh, the same amount of cost that uh, that benefits. Then the program stopped, so no more costs involved, and then then we start uh, seeing the benefits many many years later, 10, 20, 30. and there are many different outcomes that improve in these uh, children in terms of better well being, less mental um, disorders, uh, less uh, you know problems with justice, and 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 so on and and so on. So while, you know, in most areas of medicine, the investment pays off in the short term, and by short term, I mean like one year, two years, three years, in psychiatry, it usually takes longer. So we usually have elections uh, every four years, which is not the case in all countries. You know that, uh, you know, in the UK now they have it every three months, but, uh, but you know, Three, four, three, um, three, four years, and politicians who are the ones that make the decision on where, you know, what part of the tart goes into where, uh, need to sell something when they, really, they run for uh, re-election, and it's uh, more cost-effective, politically speaking, to invest in a stroke intervention or in a, a breast cancer than to invest in improving uh, mental health of people. 20 years later, when someone will take that credit credit for um, for that, so um, I, it's my belief that you know um, that uh, this political decision has a lot of to do with why we don't invest that much in, in in mental health. The other thing is that I believe that we act too late, and again, takes us to uh, third tertiary and something secondary um, uh, prevention, and. We have made a case, again, with um, Oscar Marin and other researchers, that in psychiatry, as, as we have in other areas of medicine, we have therapeutic windows. And, you know, window is something that if it's closed, it will not get the, the, the air goes, um, go through. And we have really nice examples of therapeutic windows that are open for decades, and sometimes that are open for, for minutes, right? So these are just a few examples. Uh, smoking. You know, if you stop smoking five years after you, you started, then you may catch up with the uh, people that never smoke. But if you, you know, if you stop smoking 20 years later, then you will never catch up. But you have a quite um, wide uh, window uh, there. On, on the other case, if you have a um, heart attack, the mortality reduction, if you do a reperfusion therapy, will increase the chances to, uh, that you survive by 80% if you do it in the, in the first two hours. That 80% will go down to 40% in three hours, down to 10% at seven, um, at seven hours. So one hour there is extremely important. You know, just think of uh, people that are born with um, congenital hypothyroidism, right? That they are all tested with a heel um, uh, test. If uh, you provide um, thyroid hormone, like a few days after born, there will be no damage. If you provide tons and tons of thyroid hormone one month later, the damage will be done. You know, and that kid will have intellectual disability and 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 many and many other things because the therapy, you know, the window will be um, 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 will will be closed. So in psychiatry, in psychiatry, we tend to think, and again, this department, UCSF as my department in Madrid, are two exceptions. Because if you look around the world, 80%, 90% of all chairs of the department will be adult psychiatrists. And the amount of uh, investment and interest that goes into adult psychiatry, as opposed to child psychiatry, is huge. And that happens in, in the US, in Europe, and around the world. When the reality is that this is a very recent paper in world psychiatry, the mean age for all mental disorders, all of them, and here you have bipolar, you have depression, you have PTSD, you have OCD, all of them is 14.5 years. And that's the mean. So by definition, if you want to do primary prevention, it has to be before this, right? Um, and again, there's been a 
you know, I, it's, it's too heavy focus on, on, on adult psychiatry. And this is why, you know, in a very uh, uh, provoking uh, editorial, Mara wrote that uh, psychogeriatrics starts right after adolescence. So there's nothing much that can be done after um, um, adolescence. And I, I, um, when I, when I um, spent the, the sabbatical here at UCSF that I really, really, really enjoyed, I used to take my kids to uh, Golden Gate Park. And there was this, uh, there's a place there, I don't know if you know it, where you can only go there if you take your kids. So adults are not allowed if they don't have kids. So the, the focus is in the, in the children, in, in the kids. And I think that's the, the new paradigm that we need to move uh, uh, towards. So that was the uh, introduction. So let's uh, shift now into these windows. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you some highlights of um, um, windows during development for which we, A, we know that there is a risk or resilience factor that has been replicated in different studies. And B, we can change. And there is good meta-analytic data showing that we can change that uh, factor. And that will be done for um, studies presenting for in, you know, in, human, in, in human beings. I have some few in animal models, but uh, that's probably a different, um, a different story. So most of the action in the brain takes place very early, very early in life. And that's why I many times say that uh, some of the uh, professionals that are in better position to do uh, prevention in mental health are not clinical psychologists or psychiatrists, but gynecologists and neonatologists. And they really, they really, I mean, and that's, that's people we should be working with on a daily basis. That's people we need to sit down and see, you know, what we can do. And I, again, I'll give you some uh, practical examples at the end of my, um, of, of, of my talk. Um, because when it comes to therapeutic windows, they do happen in, uh, uh, in psychiatry too. And this is just one example. Uh, I know that, you know, we're experts in the field of autism. So what happens with clinical trials? Well, in clinical trials, we include lots of people with heterogeneous conditions and with a different severity of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, symptoms. And then we test uh, a drug or a psychosocial intervention. And then we come with a grand mean, right? This is the mean of those who receive placebo versus the mean of those who receive whatever mechanism of action a drug. And that mean may be uh, significantly different or not. But the reality is that within that clinical trial, some people respond very, very well, and some people do not respond at all. And I'm pretty certain that we have killed many, many drugs in drug development because they did not distinguish from placebo, but they benefit a small proportion of uh, patients that, uh, in which that mechanism of action was related to their pathophysiology. So this is a clinical trial psychosocial intervention in autism with an overall positive treatment outcome of 39%, right? 39% improve. But when you split this group of people into two, those who were above age, age 60 months or, or, or more, or 60 months or less, it's a huge variation. So you see that in the younger kids, 67% achieve positive treatment outcome only 11% among the older kids. That tells you, you know, something, the way we run clinical trials, you know, combining different ages, uh, different um, um, uh, pathophysiologies, and so on. In this case, the only thing that made the, the, you know, huge difference was how old they were. So this means that uh, there's something I believe we're not doing right. And believe it or not, in the 17th century, this wise Spanish man called Juan de Palafox and Mendoza said that kingdoms that govern with remedies rather than prevention are headed for disaster. This was again the 17th century, and we don't, you know, we don't hear. Well, it's true that we are able to detect very, very early signs, and these are signs for psychosis and schizophrenia, but uh, they're not specific, right? So we will have a lot of false positives, and that creates a lot of you know, ethical. Lima and, 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 and conditions. Um, the other 
idea other than the therapeutic um, windows that I want to share uh, with you that may have uh, you know, profound consequences for the way we do prevention in, in psychiatry is uh, the, the shift in paradigm regarding, the, regarding risk factors. So it was not that long ago, and many people here in the audience will remember, when we were searching for the gene for schizophrenia, and the gene for autism, or the risk factor for one given mental condition, right? So not that long ago, we used to think about risk and resilience uh, uh, factors um, as silos, right? These are the risk factors for depression. These are the risk factors for schizophrenia. These are the risk factors for, um, for, for autism or, or, or you name it. Well, the recent research show us that there is no such a thing as a risk factor which is specific for a given DSM-5 or ICD disorder. And, you know, the, the, uh, the way we define uh, mental disorders in the diagnostic lab criteria, you know, they don't know anything about, you know, the genes and the different uh, etiopathic uh, physiologies. So, you know, a few examples, same genetic risk for autism or depression or bipolar or schizophrenia. Uh, you know, if you have schizophrenia and you have an offspring, the chances that your um, offspring will have schizophrenia are more or less the same as having depression or bipolar disorder. So it increases the, the, you know, the chances to have different uh, conditions. IQ will increase, uh, um, you know, low IQ or very high IQ will increase the risk to have um, 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 schizophrenia, but also bipolar disorder and so on. So all these together has made that now we conceptualize mental disorders in a more dynamic way and also, I think, more positive way for changing the outcome. So I think it's less deterministic in the sense that, you know, this single risk factor will increase chances to have this, you know, given condition. And there is a magma of pluripotentiality in which depending on what is your genetic background, but most importantly, whatever can be changed, what happens to you in life, in utero, before, before you're, you know, before you, you're born, uh, early years of, of life will make that you end up having a mental disorder or you don't have a mental disorder or you have a mental disorder with that is more or less severe with a better or worse um, um, outcome. So now I'll give you some um, um, examples. Primary prevention can be done even, even before we have a fetus. So before uh, conception, and we have you know, good studies about stress in mothers. So reducing stress in mothers before they become pregnant is a very good uh, intervention for uh, reducing the risk of uh, mental disorder in, 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 um, in, in, the, in, in the long term. Uh, there are some good animal models. Uh, this is a paper in, in Science, which this does not only happen in mothers, in females, but uh, the stress of parents, fathers, before conception also have uh, behavioral consequences three generations later. And there are now good studies with uh, cannabis in animal models, both use of cannabis in mothers and fathers before conception, before conception, and the behavioral consequences that they have transgenerationally two or three uh, generations um, later. Um, parental age, which, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an, it's an uh, obvious one. During pregnancy, uh, the use of tobacco or um, alcohol increases um, disorders like um, psychosis and schizophrenia 30 years later after a delivery. So again, some of these interventions will have an impact decades later that they, uh, that they, um, they happen. Uh, vitamin D supplementation, and this is from the Finnish um, cohorts with uh, the reference. Vitamin D, uh, the, um, in, during pregnancy will decrease the likelihood of, of having psychotic disorders in uh, uh, 30 or 40 years later. Birth and prenatal uh, period, and we have shown that hypoxia uh, during birth increases the risk of early onset um, psychosis, 
Um, so these, you know, these children adolescents are more likely to have psychosis in their childhood or um, or um, adolescence. Uh, risk of psychosis in preterm children. So there is, um, and again, I will come back to uh, this uh, as a practical sample of uh, program that we have put in place in my hospital. But uh, not long ago, uh, pre these preterm children were did not survive, you know, below, I know, age, um, you know, 30 weeks or 32 weeks. Now they survive below 26, 24, three, 400 milligrams, so nothing. But they survive at a really, really high cost. And around 60 to 70 percent of these extreme preterm children will have a neurodental disorder, you name it, um, intellectual disability, autism, uh, ADHD, and, and, and so on. So why are not we already working right, with the neonatology uh, department in, in, in trying to see what we can do? And again, I'll come, I'll come back to this um, later. And sometimes some of these risk factors come together. So women who have a severe mental condition like schizophrenia or bipolar can become pregnant. They don't, they don't take good care of themselves. So they have the genetic, um, um, you know, the, the genetic risk on the top of the uh, you know, obstetric compl uh, complications. So there's good data out there showing that we can work with these severe you know, uh, um, um, mothers and, and pregnant women who have severe mental conditions to improve the quality of their um, 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 the deliveries and the quality of their uh, pregnancies. Uh, toddler, um, toddlerhood and preschool age. So this is a CT scan. You need to be a neuroradiologist to uh, distinguish the difference between a three-year-old that didn't have uh, extreme neglect and a three-year-old with extreme neglect, and you know, yes, it's, it's so it's it's so uh, obvious the, the effect on the brain that this neglect has. Well, uh, the last uh, statistics in Europe uh, are that two in ten, so twenty percent of um, um, females uh, uh, of, of of girls have some type of sexual harassment during childhood. Twenty percent. Primary school. Child abuse uh, is associated with lots and lots of uh, mental health um, conditions. And again, one of the messages here is that there is no specific link between a, a risk factor and a mental disorder. And you know, if you're bullied, then the chances that you will have psychosis or you commit suicide or you have uh, substance use, substance misuse is increased. And some of these risk factors interact with each other. So here you have bullying and maltreatment and they increase the chances to develop psychosis six times, not twice, not three times, but six times. So can we do anything to prevent this? Yes, we published this uh, very recently, this uh, meta-analysis in uh, JAMA Pediatrics, showing that uh, we can reduce bullying schools. And this is very important for kids that already have some signs of uh, mental, uh, mental disorders. And believe it or not, the uh, population impact number, so how many people do we need to have one, right, that uh, does not have the, the outcome, is around 100. So if we establish an anti-bullying program in a school, we only need 100 children to prevent one case of bullying. What is the population impact number for reducing uh, one death, one death, uh, taking aspirin after a non-hemorrhagic um, stroke, 35,000, 35,000. What is the PIN, the population impact number for reducing one case of cancer with the uh, vaccination with the human papilloma virus in, 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 in girls, 400. So we're talking about numbers that have, you know, things, very early interventions, that have a higher impact of some of the interventions that are taken for granted outside you know, in medicine, like taking statins and things, things like that. Um, so we can prevent child abuse, and this is uh, one of the many uh, uh, meta-analyses. Of course, one of the obvious reasons you know, for you that are all very good and very clever and very good researchers is causality, right? To what extent there is causality here? This is a really nice paper published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. We know that as a rule of thumb, eight percent of eight-year-old kids will have auditory hallucinations. That's normal. We don't we don't need to do anything about that. 
but that 8% goes up to 20% in those children that are abused or bullied. So larger than expected. And what you see here is that if the abuse stops, the percentage goes back to normal. And that happens for physical abuse and that happens for, uh, for, for bullying 12 months after the follow-up. So it's a, you know, it's a really nice piece of evidence that there is some causality here. And when the risk factor stops, you go back to um, you go back to uh, normal. Another uh, window. So was you can see we're moving, you know, from uh, before conception until we're um, um, older and older. In adolescence, a clear risk factor is cannabis, and this is a hot topic around around the world. So we have conducted uh, the largest incident um, study in uh, in the world in, in many um, European cities. This is some of the uh, results. And what you can see here, this is published in 2018, is that what we learned at, at, at medical school that schizophrenia is a disorder that happened, that has the same prevalence all around the world is absolutely false. So only in Europe, the incidence of psychosis is seven times higher in South London or Amsterdam than it is in the small cities in, in rural areas in Spain. And why is this? Well, I'm sure there are many, many different causes that have to do with different uh, levels of risk factors. But one of them, and this uh, was published one year later, may have to do with cannabis. Because if you look at the cities that have the highest incidence for psychosis, they're very parallel lines with the cities that use more cannabis and more importantly, use um, uh, more strong uh, cannabis, like you know, like uh, skank, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is our belief that cannabis has something to do with this increased incidence of psychosis in some uh, in some of the European cities. Can we prevent use of cannabis in adolescence? Yes, we can. And again, what I'm showing here is the risk factor that is amenable to change, and then the meta-analysis showing that we can we can do that. So, for those of you interested, we uh, publish. Um, uh, this uh, uh, review paper in the Lancet Psychiatry 2018 with the different therapeutic windows, the different risk, the different risk factors, and the different primary prevention interventions that can be addressed during those therapeutic uh, windows. And not long ago, I wrote this uh, editorial. Someone is not listening to the facts. There is little psychiatry outside child and adolescent psychiatry. If I will have to do it again, I would probably write with preventive um, psychiatry, you know, which again, is, given the, the mean age of onset of, or, of mental disorders goes one uh, with, with another. So very recently, we have been uh, publishing on risk and resilience factors. And also we have been interested in how to promote mental health, you know, and, and not only primary prevention, but primordial prevent, uh, uh, prevention. So, uh, this is a, an example of a European um, collaboration on uh, universal and selective interventions to promote good mental health. And we talk a lot about good uh, health, but not, not much about good mental health and how it can be um, defined. Um, we have been working on population uh, attributional factors. So if we can get rid of one risk factor, what will be the percentage of people less than we will have with that condition. And believe it or not, the largest PATH uh, population attributable factor we have seen is for um, um, childhood adversities and psychotic disorders, 33%. That means that in an ideal world where children will not have to suffer, and again, this is a topic, okay, you know, uh, any adversities will have 33% less cases of, um, of psychosis. Um, so that, that has made that we have created the first atlas of, um, of uh, risk factors beyond, beyond genetics. And this was published uh, very recently in, uh, in World Psychiatry. And we have done that for each single mental disorder, from autism to um, Alzheimer's disease, with all the risk factors that are amenable to, uh, to change and what percentage of the variance that risk factors is explained. Um, again, 
if there are not specific risk factors, and this is just for psychosis, but if there, is, if there are not specific risk factors, uh, there may not be specific interventions, and that is the case. So I don't think we can say we are going to make this program to prevent schizophrenia, right? We will probably prevent many different mental, con mental, mental conditions. And again, we show, we show this for uh, prevention of, of psychosis in this paper published in JAMA Psychiatry uh, in 2020. In 20, um, uh, 20. So what are we waiting for? You know, the, 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 the evidence is out there. What are we waiting for? So in the last part, how much time do I have left? A um, couple of minutes, uh, four or five minutes. What time should I finish? Oh, okay, so Q&A, okay. So, so, you know, this guy comes uh, all the way from Spain to tell us about how important it is to do prevention in, in, in psychiatry. You know, we sit here, we are um, listening uh, to him um, uh, from home. So the end, end of story, let's go back to work. So how is, how is gonna change, how is gonna transform, how is going to, you know, how can this improve the work that we do here at, at UCSF or, you know, well, what I'm going to try to um, what I'm going to try to show you now is how this, at least in our hands, how this transformed the way we practice uh, um, psychiatry, the way we, we practice mental health in 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 our institution. So I'll give you some some a few examples of programs that we have in place. So this is not theory; this is practical, you know, practical stuff, pragmatic that are, are running in my hospital in, uh, in, in, in Madrid. So the first one is that we have a program in which um, uh, clinical psychology psychiatrists do not have an office in the hospital, do not have an office in the uh, community out, um, uh, um, outpatient center. They don't have offices, they work in schools. They go, they, you know, we have 15, uh, 15 public schools, primary and secondary for one psychiatry and one psychologist, and they go there you know, every day from Monday to, uh, to, to Friday. And they have different uh, programs. Some of them are not primary prevention. So these are for kids that are already sick when they go back to school, someone tries to commit suicide, but some of them are for prevention and promotion. So they give psychoeducational talks to them, to, uh, to, to parents. They, you know, they work on um, how to improve empathy, how to um, uh, um, 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 help others that when they're suffering, how to ask for help, you know, the things that probably make that the pandemic around the world, around the world was, uh, had a higher impact in a very vulnerable population that was um, adolescents uh, and much, a much higher impact that it had in, 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 in adults. And I strongly believe that it was because, you know, some of um, the adolescents nowadays are um, used to immediate, uh, immediate reward. They want things fast. And, you know, when we told them that they, had to be locked down. They thought it was the, the end of the, uh, the the end of the world, and that increases increase the risk of suicidality again around around the world. So we're very much into um, working in uh, in hospitals, and actually WHO released the most comprehensive and longest report ever from WHO on mental health four or five months ago, advising that we should change the way we provide services in mental health. And this was one of the examples they, um, uh, they gave. We have to go you know, where the people are rather than having the people coming to, to uh, where we are. So this is um, you know, it's a clinical program. It's a clinical program. And of course, we embed some uh, research. So our last clinical trial, which is not published, so this is just in methodology, and we are uh, we're working on, on, on the paper. In our last uh, clinical trial, we did not randomize patients to receive a drug or placebo. We randomize schools, 20 schools, to receive a intervention to reduce bullying or uh, to continue as they were. So in, we included more than 6,000 um, students in this uh, clinical trial with a baseline assessment, post-intervention one year later, and a follow-up was, to, was, to, was supposed to be one year later and happened two years later because of the, uh, of the pandemic. And what we saw in this clinical trial, that again is not published yet, is that, sorry about, because this is a, this, it's in Spanish, but it's very easy uh, to, to read, is that 
We didn't see any difference in secondary school. And again, this talks in favor of the therapeutic window. It's probably too late to work on values and work on empathy at this age. But we saw a time by group interaction in primary prevention. And most importantly, we selected only public schools that had um, classes of children with special educational needs. So there is a world tendency to have less schools for um, um, or, or, or special educational schools and integrate kids with autism or the neurodevelopmental disorder in regular schools. But there, which is, you know, which is, which is good, it's, it, it, yeah, I think it's a way to go, but it comes with a risk. And the risk is that, especially during breaks, these kids are usually uh, bullied, right? When there's no, 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 no people around. That's, that's, a, that, that's a high price. So we had a number of around 300, 400 kids with special educational needs in this clinical trial. And they also show a reduction of bullying. So the bully here, I don't have data, but the bullying here was four times larger in kids with special educational needs. And the effect was again larger in the reduce, uh, in reducing bullying in this specific uh, cohort of, uh, of children. So this is a, you know, an example of how to do primary prevention uh, also from the clinical and the research perspective. This is the second one. In 2016, we uh, started this uh, clinic in which everyone, any age with a known genetic condition is referred to us. Uh, and this is a genetics and mental health uh, program. So we have referrals mostly from genetic departments of most of the times children that are diagnosed with genetic conditions that we know increase a lot the risk to have uh, um, a mental disorder. You name it, 22Q11, 22Q13, and, and, and many, many of, many of them. So we see them when they're healthy. So they don't, you know, most of them don't have any single mental, mental condition. And we work with them, we work with their families, we work with the school, we try to reduce risk factors, we try to reduce the stress, we try to reduce bullying. We, you know, for 22 Q11 that ha have 20 times, uh, today they're 20, 20 times more likely to have um, schizophrenia than the general population. And 50% of them will have psychotic uh, symptoms. You know, when they uh, uh, um, when they go to get to the adolescence, we explain them. You know how uh, cannabis may be more uh, detrimental for them than it is for the general population. So um, we do a cognitive functioning, try to adapt the expectations that parents have depending on what you know what's their IQ and 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 so on. And um, and again, this is what we do with them in this uh, behavioral genetics clinic. You know, screening parenting support, um, coordination with education, family support, neuropsychological assessment, and, and depending on what age they, they are. So this is another example of primary uh, prevention because again, most of them are healthy by the time we see them for, uh, for the first time. Um, we also have a psychosis uh, prevention clinic. These are either people that are selected uh, based on uh, risk factor, like, you know, this is, it will be selective primary, a prevention because their their parents have uh, um, schizophrenia or because they have some early signs that would be indicative uh, uh, primary uh, prevention. And what we do, what do we offer to them? Well, all these uh, interventions, uh, linkage, uh, we, you know, ex um, extensive work with schools, um, uh, diagnostic, neuropsychological, and parenting assessment, parent education, and so on. And again, we do this with offsprings. Again healthy most of the times, offsprings of parents with severe mental disorder or kids that are referred to us because they have some very early signs of, um, of um, um, psychosis. And does this work? Well, it seems to work. This is a meta-analysis published in uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Psychiatry showing that interventions decrease the risk of having a mental disorder by 40%, 40% in these offsprings of parents with severe mental condition. So I, I guess this is something we should, you know, we should be, uh, we should be doing. Uh, more recently, we have started this other clinical program with the neonatology department, in which we assess and see um, for the first six years all extreme preterm babies, and we work on the bond, we work on, you know, the the the, the, the very 
early um, um, steps. Not, 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 not all of them uh, survive, but you know, the ones that um, uh, survive, we try to uh, work with, with, uh, with the parents and try to detect early signs of autism or any other neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. And with that, I hope that I convince you that primary prevention is not science fiction. And if you're not convinced yet, uh, you can read this paper that is about to be published uh, for in, a couple of, in, in a couple of weeks with uh, Paolo Cusapoli from the Con King's College of, of London. And I will conclude by saying that there is little interest in preventative interventions in our um, um, specialty, that I strongly believe that uh, there should be a priority for in the next years to focus in the very early intervention, taking into account these therapeutic windows and that primary prevention programs that have been shown to be cost effective should already be implemented in all our um, departments. And I will thank the many, many researchers in our research group that are responsible for many of the data that I have shown. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we're gonna open it up for a couple of questions. I, I see one question over here. Thank you. Hi, oh, sorry, I thought I was loud. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. I'm Marina Tulusham's. It's really a pleasure to hear you talk. And I was listening through Zoom until I could actually get here in person. Um, so I'm a child psychologist and also trained as a prevention scientist. So this talk was just really phenomenal and thought provoking to me in another area too, that you bring up about, you know, that the field is acting too late. And I'm curious what your thoughts are and what your experience has been given COVID and the increase, the huge surge in mental health crises in children, adolescents, and adults. So now more than ever, the funding and the emphasis is on treatment, crisis, these pieces. So I'm curious, given your expertise and the work that you've been doing, what you would suggest around policy, advocacy, how we continue to move forward with prevention in what is ahead of us. Yeah. Excellent question. Um, it was it was um, really two years ago, like a few months after we had the first wave, which was terrible. I was just talking about this in, in Madrid in March 2020. When I, um, you know, was, at that time I was this, the president of the Spanish Society of Psychiatry, and I mentioned that, you know, the mortality that we're seeing uh, based on how many cases, how many people die from the infection itself is going to be ridiculous as compared to how many people die from the consequences that the pandemic will have for the health systems, regardless of being infected or not. And the reality is that life expectancy in Spain is uh, three years lower than it was three years ago. And a small fraction of that is based on the people who died infected by COVID. Uh, it has a lot to do with the people that we did not take care of, people with lots of conditions, uh, you know, uh, people that had, uh, um, uh, you name it, oncolo you know, oncological processes and, 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 and so on. Uh, because we stopped the ones for, you know, to, to, to provide with that, uh, with, with those services. And it also happens. It also happened in, in, in our field. So the kids that have developmental delays did not go to um, an early stimulation um, at clinics and, you know, and, 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 and again, those windows are closed. So, you know, if it, if it was not done at that, that age, three years later, it's probably, it's probably too late. So I strongly believe that the pandemic had a really um, uh, negative consequences, um, and even more so uh, in, in people that, you know, don't have anything to do with, it, with, with infection. Um, I, on the other hand, I believe that this pandemic has had a positive uh, outcome for uh, for our field and now more than ever and again this is around the world people are talking about mental health and you see lots of um, music stars uh, um, sports athletes uh, politicians uh, around the world saying that if they this can happens to everyone they it happens to to them and i see that there is a movement towards uh trying to uh, make this a more, um, um, you know, regular thing, less stigmatized. And, and the governments are like, you know, this EU approval of a huge budget for mental health 
few months a uh, few months ago they 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 are um, starting to realize that this is something that has been neglected for a long time so i i urge you know all of you to take advantage of this opportunity because this this doesn't happen twice in the world you know in in, in some people's uh, uh, lifetime so um we paid a high a high uh, price for this pandemic but for the field of mental health for the field of psychiatry i believe it, uh, we have a huge opportunity in front of us and we should not uh, miss it thank you so much hi i'm andrea serita i'm a geriatric psychiatrist also from europe so maybe an exchange program would help us visit madrid a little bit more often um so i have a question for you. i love the the thought provoking talk thank you so much I wonder what your thoughts are about prodromes of neurodegenerative diseases which which some of us are very interested here in presenting with psychiatric symptoms but then you know the full cognitive full neurological picture occurs maybe decades later and if you see that as a potential for therapeutic early intervention when we will have disease modifying agents which we don't have much of right, right now thank you yeah so yeah, great, great, great uh, question that I, you know, I show my conflict of interest in my second slide. I, I didn't, I should have said that my major conflict of interest is my area of interest. So I'm a child psychiatrist, so that's I'm biased. So most of the data that I've shown is data that we've been working on in, in, child, in child psychiatry. Uh, there is an excellent report by the Royal College of Psychiatry that was launched uh, this summer, summer in, in June, July, August, uh, 2022, showing um, all the evidence for uh, um, primary prevention in neurodegenerative disorders. So that that's something you should uh, you should read. Uh, things like literacy, or things like um, 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 sports, like you know physical act physical activity that reduces the risk of uh, of um, of um, dementia. We we'll, in that it, it atlas that I show um, you in the world psychiatry. We we'll also look at uh, neurodegenerative um, um, disorders. So I, I you know. Again, your question, which is very relevant, also, also brings the issue of, you're talking about probably secondary prevention, right? When we have the modifying agents that change what? Something that is already there. But I think the way forward is that we don't need to wait for those agents. We can do things to have dementia and those early signs later, right? Because it's, it's, it's the same as you look at the literature on uh, preventing psychosis. So you look at programs that try to prevent first episode of psychosis. The reality is that is 90% 90, 90 of the time, that's not primary prevention. Because those subjects already have depression, already have anxiety, already have other mental conditions. Yes, they are less severe, right? And only 20% of them will convert into schizophrenia. But 90% will end up having some mental condition, which is already present by the time, you know, at, at baseline. So that in itself is secondary, is secondary prevention. So my idea here is more, more uh, moving towards earlier on, using things so they don't have those early signs that are probably a sign of a uh, uh, mental condition. Thank you.